Don't just think about this as trout, small mouth, large mouth, they're gonna eat them. What you want is an area that has plenty of trees and then you want undisturbed ground. Go pull up your satellite photos. We got lots of lakes, lots of lakes with lots of timber around them. This is the world famous, <laughs> Carter, Arkansas famous, <laughs> trout famous. Maybe a street. Steve Daly. <laughs> hey, the, boys. The unruly Aussie <laughs> is back. The unruly Aussie. Yeah, I'll probably accept that. Yeah. Uh, nice to be back, gentlemen. Yeah, man. Thanks for uh, mm. welcoming us back to Cotter and uh, mm-hmm. spending some time with us. There's some news going around that mm. there's going to be a big cicada hatch. And I know that there's some some truth, but there's also a lot of misinformation out there. So... Help me break it down. What are what are we looking at, and what's going on this year? So, in coming up in May June, we're seeing the uh, emergence for the first time in thirteen years. What is the our thirteen year periodic cicadas? And you've seen the national news, and and in a general sense, to people who aren't fishermen on these rivers and lakes. There is a, this is a big event, right? And if you're a bug watcher and you like the outdoors, the, the fact there are two cicada hatches this year, and what they call broods, um, there's a 17 year that's going to be further north here. Um, but the two broods actually don't touch. And people have been saying it's like, man, they're gonna, we're going to have both. Mm-hmm. And it's just really the two broods are distinct and separate. Um, we are going to have... Arkansas and the White River here, this area, we have the 13-year brood 19. Um, and it is, it's probably the biggest brood within in the, in the U.S. and it covers the most area. Um, covers, you know, uh, from the Appalachians all the way through to the Ozarks, up into, or across into Missouri, the Ozark Plateau. Mm. And it is, it is going to be big. Mm. But it's very dependent on where you're going to, where you live, what you, whether you're in an urban or a, a, a country environment, um, whether you're going to see the bugs. The one thing about these periodic cicadas is when they emerge, they're all there at one time. Their life cycle in our world is six weeks. <laughs> really? Six weeks, mate and die. It's not like mayflies short, but what it means is – all these bugs are there at the one time and they're loud and they're noisy and mm-hmm. they're visible. They're big bugs. Yeah. And, you know, you'll crunch them underfoot and, and you'll see the dead carcasses and it's it's a smorgasbord for all of nature. Yeah. Whether you're a fish in the rivers, whether you're a, a rivers and lakes, whether you're uh, copperheads, copperheads love them. Really? Yeah. Copperheads apparently will congregate and climb trees and stuff. So if mm. you're going looking for them out and out in the wilderness, you know, keep your eyes open, wear some snake boots and yeah. stuff because you don't want to get bit. But like all these things key, all these key into on and this one really quite brief event that's late spring, early summer when the ground warms up enough. So these, so these cicadas, they stay underground burrowed for 13 years. Almost 13 years. Almost 13 years. And then they come out and they're only really above ground for like six weeks, is mm-hmm. what you're saying. Yep. And they just do that to, I guess, a mate. Mate, yeah, that's how they, they go get back together. In. Yeah, so what happens is, so we take the two adults back in 2011. They found each other. They made little babies. <laughs> <laughs> and mommy and daddy. I'll, I'll leave you, mommy and daddy, love. really, you know. <laughs> um, and the female goes across and finds some, like, tender young branch shoots, right, in the tree. And she has a little spike, for want of a better term sticks the spike, lays the eggs in the branch and they feed in there on the sap and grow up until they become a nymph stage and then they, which is a, which is a number of weeks later, and they drop out, drop to the ground and they dig in and burrow down about nine inches and they live and feed on roots and the sap out of the roots for that next 13 year period. Wow. And then they pop out, climb up into the trees, they go another stage change which is less important to us. Although, unless you want to eat them, 
because apparently the white ones, when they first emerge, taste like asparagus. Really? So I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> Can't confirm yourself. <laughs> that's right. Well, and, and that's that was what I was finding was the funny thing here because, I mean, I've been here 24 years. I've seen one hatch. Mm-hmm. If you've lived in Arkansas, this this happens so rarely in Arkansas that it's hard to build up knowledge. Like I've seen the, the, the sulfur hatch and the caddis hatch every year, multiple right. years. I I know what's going to happen. Yeah, I have got good idea, good idea what time, what they're going to look like, where they're going to be. This hatch, really. If you're a fishing guide here, there's very few done multiple hatches. Mm-hmm. There's a handful of us old crusty grey guys that have seen <laughs> twice, right? Yeah. And even then, twice isn't enough to pattern. You know, the second time, yeah. even seeing two isn't enough to really pattern it because, no, hell, not. I can barely remember what my name is, what I did last night, let alone. Right. <laughs> yeah, two times, it's not enough to get any kind of meaningful experience yeah. to be saying, like, this is exactly what you can expect and this is exactly what everyone should be doing. Yes, so to come back to 2011 and then look at it a little historically, what happened? Let's deal with the two rivers. So Bull, I'm, I'm talking below Bull Shoals too, because I don't, I didn't, wasn't anywhere near Northwest Arkansas at the time, and sure. so on. But on below Bull Shoals Dam, we were looking for these bugs, and it happened that that year, 2011, was a super wet year. They blew 60,000 CFS out in out of the floodgates in early May. And, like, that's as big as they've done on since the dams have been built. Wow. And, like, so it's way up here on these banks. Mm-hmm. And we're all like, man, it's the wet weather that's pushed them away because we're not seeing them on the banks. On the other hand, Norfolk was stacked. Dry Run Creek, which is the world's best kids' fishery, I'm sure you guys have looked at that, mm-hmm. um, they were there everywhere. I had a younger stepdaughter over there and whacking them on you know, big rainbows and big browns. We mm-hmm. didn't, didn't ever land the biggest brown. Coming up and eating cicadas on top and it was like it's just insane. That's awesome. Big good fun. Yeah. But the, between the two, there was just this dichotomy because it's like, and my house in Mountain Home, which is on a natural hillside, lots of timber. You couldn't hear yourself think there, like it was insane. But you come out here to the white and I'd get to work and we'd be fishing at State Park and you could hear them maybe up on the ridge. And it was like the thought process is because, honestly, we all knew jack shit, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't know. Yeah, (laughs) you're guessing. Yeah. Educated guess. Because you go back 22 years here, there's very few guides around. Mm -hmm. That was before before what and before most of the regular guides on the river here. I think Davey arrived about the time and fished it, but I don't know that he was seriously guiding in the previous hatch in the late 90s. Um, so, you know, we really were only guessing as to what the situation was on the white, and we thought it was per- it was tied to the weather conditions in that year. So you flip it over and start looking, and I because of this hatch coming up, I want to find out. Because I'm an inquisitive, I'm an ex-journalist, I'm a nosy bastard, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Curious uh, Yeah, folk. sure. <laughs> so, and, and, and I started looking and I started reaching out to my friends because one of the inspirations after that 2013 hatch, sorry, 2011 hatch, we did get one epic fish in 2011. Yeah, you showed the picture. Yeah. It was a 30 beast. Inch, 30 inch brown, five weight, dry, uh, fly, five weight bamboo fly rod. And but that was a found fight. Oh yeah, well that that every time that fish went for the bottom, <laughs> that rod just bent into the cork, <laughs> but it protected the tippet like it was, it, and because we we're in a really bad, ugly structure, and that fish could have popped us off left, right, and centre, and we were probably out fishing three x, and this fish is so eight pound test, and <sighs> bloody you know fish over ten pounds, and probably twelve, and and. Every time it went to the bottom, but it didn't fight dirty and it was just fight clean. It came out off the bank. But what we, what happened was is it's, we both saw, I was actually tying on a fly. It was the owner of the fly shop. We had the, had the fly in his hand. I'd taken him out and we'd gone and found the bugs in, in one spot and I saw a little wink, right? 
looks like an 18-inch hopper. And I, he said, should I cast? And I said, well, it's not going to do much good sitting in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and he made the cast and it was in the right spot and slurp. I even kept tying the fly on and he's set because I'm going, that's eh, just, you know, yeah. little guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I swam out of the bank and it's was like, Jim, I think that's a bit bigger than <laughs> – 18. We might want to be a bit patient on this. Yeah. So we started it, and I got got my net lined up on it after a, a few minutes in. Jim, I think that's 30 because I had a big wide net at the time, and this fish is ridiculous. And it measured up. That was what it measured at, Ross spot at 30. Wow. Which is crazy big fish, and, and it's the kind of thing that inspires people. But that was rare. I don't know of any others that that year being caught. Yeah. That's a, I mean, to, to catch a 30 inch brown, which is a, for so many people, for the majority of people is once in a lifetime fish. That, Absolutely. That, you know, people come to Arkansas to find. Mm-hmm. Like that is what people are looking for is if you can land a 30 inch fish, you've done something. And so to yeah. do it on a cicada. On a bamboo rod. Is even yeah. more special. So I think we've got out of the fly shop, I think it's like three on hoppers in a, in 13 years, yeah. all the guides we've gotten, as good as they all are, yeah, there's three of that order. Wow. It's in the, yeah, that's how big it was. That's amazing. Anyway, so coming back to this year then, so we're really looking at what's going. I, I, for that presentation, I wanted to find out truly. And after that 2011 experience, I started seeing videos from buddies of mine, Tennessee, Appalachians, right? Tennessee, um, North Carolina, because those guys are super lucky because in that area, they have multiple broods that pop up. At, so they may, have a, they may have a 17-year hatch in 2015 and through a couple of years later or three or four years later, they have some 13s and then they'll have another one pop up. And, and, it's, and by driving three or four hours – that in 10 years you may be able to experience five or six different hatches mm-hmm. and now you're starting to build some credibility right. as I know how to hatch fish this hatch, yeah. right? And the annuals, and you just, then you have them all yeah, the and time. Yeah, they're, they're, and the annuals, like when I first came here, I was told that they trout don't eat them. They're hmm. too spiky and whatever. Yeah. Yeah, we found that out two years ago. Yeah, the, they eat them, right? They do, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I started talking to him, and one name's super familiar, and he's a buddy, and he's fished here with us, and that's Blaine Chocolate, who I've always known has probably got is one of the most innovative fly tires in the country, in the world. And he has a great cicada pattern, and he was chasing them around. But I had another buddy in Knoxville who ran a fly shop, and I saw a photo of them dry fly fishing for carp on a relatively small lake, and this is 10, 12, 15-pound carp, on fly rods, taking people into the backing, eating dry flies. Oh my God, Amazing. that's like, oh, Sign me I up. just yes, yes. Where am I? When, when can I come over, Alan? Yeah. And and it just blew up from there. And uh, so I reached out to another buddy, Alan Broyhill, who's direct uh, media director of Southern Culture on the Fly, an electronic magazine. That's 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 awesome. And we're I'm trying to get more content in from this part of the South. Um, and reached out to these guys and to get pick their brains as to what we could apply here really on this hatch rather than flying blind. And then I started looking and their information was has been built a lot of the picture. I think we can help people in figuring it out. Mm-hmm. And it's all about where the bugs are going to be. Yeah. Because if you remember as I talked about the life cycle, they need trees and they live nine inches under the ground. Mm-hmm. So what you want – is an area that has plenty of trees, bunches of trees, and a mixed age group. So you're getting some young, some older, because you, what you wanted was those young tender shoots 13 years ago. Right. So now it's a 13-year older tree, right? So yeah. it can be an older tree. And then you want undisturbed ground. So that takes out anywhere that's been farmed, anywhere they've built a house, road, cleared land, right. messed around with it like that. Or say the North Fork of the White up in Missouri, you don't want you don't want that riverbank cleared. Mm-hmm. Right? The, yeah. the gravel moved and, and mm-hmm. those trees taken away. All that all that then turns around and you start looking at it. And I start pulled up some satellite mats with the White River through below Bullshells Dam. You can go and look and and see what has been 
bunches of it here disturbed. And yeah. I started, I had an aha moment. And it is like, I know why there weren't any bugs up here at Cotta because all that land's been cleared, mm-hmm. right? And it was cleared before 2011. Yeah. Now, and then go and take what's been cleared since mm-hmm. and some of the ridge lines are where, where it's gone. And price of progress, this is one of the things that the scientists, like um, the scientists will tell you is that the broods are shrinking because of land clearing, right? Uh, you know, agriculture, pesticides, all these things that take a toll. Like there was the the brood we're going to get, uh, I read that there's some reports they think it's extinct and we'll find out this year in southern Arkansas, Louisiana, um, because there's just the pressure of human life, mm. if you like. Yeah. Um, so they're shrinking back and they were way bigger. And they've been shrinking back. Um, Gene Kritsky's book, Tale of Two Broods, there's a story in there from a gentleman from Joplin, Missouri in the 1800s saying that the broods are declining then. Mm. So they've been declining that long. Wow. Over his lifetime. Yeah. And that was one of the earliest reports they had from this area. And he was talking about them along the White River and so on. Man, that's crazy to think about. Like, I mean, we know that the the, the development of Northwest Arkansas and, and North Arkansas and just the Ozarks in general as people move here, you know, you think about just in the last five years how much it's changed. Yes. Then zoom out to what's changed in the last 13 years. You forget, like, how much has changed. And you'd really, I guess, to go back and figure out maybe what banks you're looking for or what hasn't uh-huh. been disturbed, you'd have to go and look at, like, historical satellite imagery and see, like, okay, yes, 13 years ago, but even before that, like, were they disturbed so that those that brood couldn't lay and uh-huh. dig and burrow there? And then, I don't know, that's like, you'd really have to dive <laughs> into the research and figure out, like, pinpoint on... Uh-huh. I can I'm fish... A bug historian. Yeah, yeah. I can fish here. <laughs> well, it, it, it's... I'd, I'd, I'd cut it out. I'd, I wouldn't go that detailed. I'd go and look at, like, the most recent, like, go and pull up your Google Maps. Yeah. And go and start looking for, okay, really what's what's got houses on it? Mm-hmm. Let's stay away from that. What's farmland? Let's stay away from that. Yeah. Let's go look at where there's trees, mm-hmm. stands. Because you, and you can probably be fairly reliable. They've been around if sure. they're really decently mature trees. They've been there 13 years. Because that's going to be the key to having a good time. And that's where we're trying to get to in this discussion, right? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Why, what is going to be the best way to find and maximize this hatch? And it is find where the bugs are, mm-hmm. right? So what do you need? You need trees, yeah. not cleared land. Right. So um, Norfolk still has got advantages. Like there's been some clearing in the time, but Norfolk still got a bunch of advantages there. Dry Run Creek's going to be awesome. Don't just think about this as trout. Everyone gets excited about trout, but mm. small mouth. Yeah. They're going to eat them. Yeah. Large mouth. Rivers, lakes, everything. And that was Blaine Chocolate's point. He said, I love fishing period cicada hatches on lakes more than rivers. And I, I was like, but why, you know? Because I'm kind of brown trout centric. Yeah. I'll throw at anything, but, you know, love me, by, love me some brown trout. And he said that the... You know, on rivers, the bugs go away. There's a river current carries yeah. them down. Yeah, they fall and then yeah. they get washed down yeah. by them. But on lakes, they stay there. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. We got lots of lakes. Mm-hmm. And we got lots of lakes with lots of timber around them. Mm-hmm. Go pull up your satellite photos. Now, beaver has changed a bunch. Mm-hmm. I, in fact, I can't believe it. I was up there just recently. Really? Yeah. My wife's a real estate agent these days and... Uh, she, we were showing some property around the north end of Beaver Lake, and I used to live there, and it's, oh, my God, there's, like, so many more places. But there's still big swathes of of mature timber there that you're going to get that's going to bring cicadas. Um, Bull Shoals, Norfolk, both these lakes. And you know what they've got in them? Big carp, mm-hmm. stripers, largemouth. All these mm-hmm. species are a lot of fun. Yeah. And for a lot of people... East of here and the Appalachians, the guys are targeting big carp, 20, 30, 40 pounds, and, and striped bass. Striped bass or hybrids. On the cicadas? On the cicadas. Oh, they man. will eat them. That's cool. A striped bass on a cicada. Oh, yeah. On the top. I want that. Yeah. Dude, I want that lake. so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Unreal. 
It's like lottery, lottery, oh, yeah. 1.3 billion. Well, that's way striper. better than the Give alternative, me the striper. Oh. which is the <laughs> little bait fish, fish pattern, and you better be deep, and you better play it right. I mean, that's like, oh, yeah. that's like catching a sunfish. A little, you know, a yes. little perch for the first time when you're learning to fish, but it's 40 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it let it sit out there. Oversized Twitch it around. Fish, yeah. <laughs> and everyone's so excited about this in trout. And, you know, okay, maybe it's because I, well, we got a 30 in 2011. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's like, man, there's so much good fishing off, not just trout. Right. And it's going to be a lot more accessible. And, you know, again, look for that same thing. Places with banks. Um, if you can get, uh, so if it's if we're running prevailing westerly winds, find one and fish on the eastern side of that bank on the to the west of you. Yeah, because it'll push them out of the trees. One thing people think is that these these things migrate around like like locusts. They actually only travel about half a mile from where they're hatched, mm-hmm. okay. and that's one of the other things reasons why development is so bad on these bugs because they don't. They don't move well. Right. Right. Like if you take out that whole area and yeah. you, you clear 10 acres, they're probably like that's their home range. Like yeah, you, you've kind of it. gotten rid of it. Yeah. So they're not coming back. Now you can, they'll bump in off the edges perhaps sure. over time, but you know, 13 year cycles, we don't have many of those in our lives. Right. Right. And, um, you know, the, the other things then comes into, you know, some of the stuff we talked about presentation. Mm hmm. Right, uh, and uh, finding those, finding those bugs. You can probably pick a heavier rod though if you're going chasing striped bass. On yeah, them, you're right? gonna need to size up a little <laughs> bit for sure. <laughs> you guys have talked to Dan Roberts, haven't you? Yeah, uh, the oh, stripers. Yeah. Oh, I imagine he's gonna be all over this. Yeah, I'd so would I like to be out on Beaver. Maybe you do. yeah, Dan, we're coming fishing with you, buddy. Yeah, but I mean that. But if we can get bass coming up in some of those little quiet. Oh, some points. <laughs> Backs of coves. Oh, my God. That's just, for a dry fly fisherman, that's like, it's, it's, that's almost alien. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's like crazy cool stuff. Um, you know, some of the other things that we learnt off these guys that I did in this presentation is like, you know, tying, is the patterns, right? Yeah. Fly patterns. So... Everyone thinks of a cicada as being, you know, a size four or six, something, you know, big, big. Mm-hmm. No, in 20, 2011, I've got some photos and it's about as long as the Sage logo on my rod. Mm-hmm. And I can send you guys this picture, but the, the bugs are quite, the lowland bugs that are closer around the river mm-hmm. are quite small. Eights, sixes, maybe even some tens. Um, they've got little short legs. Some of them are a little orange. But they don't have, it's not necessarily a big leg, wobbly leg thing like we normally deal with on our hoppers and cicadas for this area. Um, they're not all orange bellied. Like the the lowland cicadas, black or black with orange stripes, the bigger ones that come up on the high bluffs, which may come, come and intercede with us, they have, um, they are largely the orange belly or orange and black orange stripes. Stripes, yeah, yeah. right. Um, so, and they're bigger, know, right? Yeah, the, so the, they're they're running up as like sixes. Okay, but the ones that are lower and closer to the river that you'd likely see in the water, those are going to be a little bit smaller. Yep. with less of the orange, almost completely dark black. Either dark black or black with an orange stripe. Yeah. Um, the other thing people that they talked about, like socks, was really emphatic about make the damn thing slap. Mm. Right? Make them splat on the water. Mm -hmm. So if your leader, you know, leader's a little short, that's one way to get a splat. But also, like, your fly can have... Oh, excuse me. Your fly can have some foam on it, Mm. right? Help it splat down. Mm -hmm. um, Part of that, too, is that overpowering a cast and a little shorter leader, and you can make some noise. Yeah. That's one difference that if you're learning fly fishing and you're getting into it or maybe you know you go once a year with a guide but you, you're excited about cicadas maybe for trout the difference of like a mayfly or a caddis is they're hatching out of the water yeah and then coming up and resting on it to dry off their wings and take off so you want your cast yeah, like it, it needs to be light and gentle a bit you want de- it to just, a lot more delicate yeah delicate just lands there oh, no. it doesn't sink it just Not this. sits <laughs> Because it's coming up out of the water. These yeah. cicadas, I mean, they're hatching out of the ground. They're like yep. accidentally then, flopping into the water <laughs> and they're drowning. Yeah, they're <laughs> crashing into it. Yeah. And so 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. I mean, yeah. it makes sense. Yep. Big old bugs falling out of the sky. They're going to hit the water, and there's going to yep. be water movement. Now, right. early stage bugs, when they were alive, they're going to be – their wings will be out, mm-hmm. right? Not just swept back. Um, later on the hatch, you'll actually get dead bugs coming out of the trees, like just lifeless, just flat, falling. Yeah. falling. And their bugs, their wings are going to be more up and down the body. So you're going to need a selection of different patterns, you know. And I imagine that – you know, you're going to be able to pick them up in a few places, but they're going to be, you know, good flies are going to be hard in demand. Mm. But equally, everyone I talk to on this is, yeah, there's little tweaks every year. They might not hit the bug they hit 11 years ago. And the Tennessee guys is like, oh, this one didn't work this year. And it worked then. Worked at the start of the hatch, didn't work at the end. Because by the end of the hatch, and like we're talking about this, they'll hatch out probably over a... <laughs> The whole thing will last six weeks, mm-hmm. of which you probably have a couple of weeks build up, because once they come out of the trees, they they've got that takes them a few days to get mature, be ready to sing, and then it's then they start singing to mate, and that's what makes the noise. That's mm-hmm. a mating call, and then that's the key period, and they're going to have a week probably of build up. So you got two weeks, then you got two weeks where it's on, mm-hmm. and then you got two weeks where the amount of bugs will tail off. There's your six weeks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So don't don't when, don't procrastinate. Yeah. When it's time, it's time. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's like you can you need to do your research and have your flies tied and be prepared to go now because it's based on your research. When is that six weeks starting? Uh, when the ground temperature hits sixty five. Okay. Nine inches down. Okay. Nine inches down. Yeah. Okay. That is the that is yeah. the that is the precise measurement, and um, we're not there yet. No, it's no. Cold. It's actually my it's toes are a little cold. <laughs> yeah. I got boots on right now. So you're saying if you've got a, a meat probe, a thermometer, go stick it in the dirt nine inches down. <laughs> if that, yeah, and it's like okay, so and then go wash it before you use it again. <laughs> so my house faces south, so we get sun during the day. They're going to come there first, right? Well, they will on the other side of the hill. So where are you? Mm-hmm. That side of the river is going to be different to this side of the river, right? Nothing's easy in yeah, fly no, fishing. It's, it's all maybe, right? Yeah. So that accounts for some of those differences. And otherwise it'd be shorter. Could that spread out the six weeks? Like so if you do have maybe on the on the warm side of the river or the sunny side, the south facing slopes. It'll that be might, six weeks. That might start it's about six weeks. A week earlier than someone the the bugs that are on the shady side yeah. of the river. Yeah. Okay. It could by a little bit. Yeah. 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 Remember, so we're all just guessing. I mean, yeah, we're... it's right. It's like, sure. Yeah. You, know, you can make up something. <laughs> hey, in theory, it say sounds it. good, right? This is the secret to guiding for everyone, yeah. little boys and girls. The secret to guiding is everything you say, say it with confidence. <laughs> and then they'll believe you because you believe it. Yeah. It doesn't mean how much. <laughs> but it. says, yes, there's a fish right there. There hasn't been a fish there. <laughs> Years, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I think this hatch is going to be a lot of fun, but I. I I guess I'm. I, I guess I was seeing so much red about it. It's going to be epic on the white and hearing it. And it's like, guys, spread your wings a little bit. Mm-hmm. Spread your wings. Go look for them. Yeah. Find the bugs. Be prepared, and you'll have a much better time. I think. Yeah. It's not they're not going to be here, and I hope they're they're epic everywhere. And I'm totally wrong. And right. It's like, oh, they've all just come back, and they're all floating down Cotter Bank. Yeah, you, you know? would love to be wrong. In that. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, because that looks like close to home. But I think we have to search it out and go and have a good time. Yeah. Are, do you think that you'll kind of take, um, was it Blaine's advice to hit the hit the lakes a little bit and, and try to go Maybe. Hit, hit some bigger <laughs> fish up there? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually have some evidence. It's uh, a good friend of mine, Jeff Trigg, um, he came down here and didn't hit the rivers. He hit – because – I I can't remember the trigger reason why he didn't hit the rivers. He went and fished the north end of of um, Bull Shoals Lake and on the Missouri side and just smoked big carp up there. Mm. Uh, this this is a real thing. Um, and you know we've caught them on Norfolk. I know people caught a bunch of fish on Norfolk. The white was more patchy and more scattered. Um, there are places you can go, and a bit of search that. Search that spot out. It's like any sort of fly fish, any sort right. of fishing. Yeah. You know, find where the find where the fish are, work out what they're eating and feed it to them. Yeah. Yeah. Fish it's a, simple. That's the simple formula. <laughs> Just do that. It is. It is. Salt water, whatever. Yeah. 
So for you, and I know you're going to say it depends, right? And and we've just Always. we've just talked about why it depends and how there's variables in it. But for you, or, or for someone listening, like day one, just to get them started in the right direction, what would be kind of the setup that you would go out in a boat or even off the bank? Like, what would you go with as far as your rod, your line, the fly size, yeah, all that sure. stuff? Sure. You know, the first thing I'll do though, I'm going to do drive around with the windows down. Find the bugs. Yeah. Hear that. You're going to scout. So, yeah. So I, I'm setting up. I'm going to have, for the white and most places, um, Crooked Creek and so on, I'm going to be running a six weight. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I'm a sage guy. So I'm running R8s and igniters and floating lines, probably a 3X, 2X leader, depending on the size of the fly I'm throwing. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm going to be setting. And it's going to be, it's going to be simple. You don't have to worry about droppers or anything like that. Yeah. You could run two bugs, but, you know, they may eat both of them and then you're in. <laughs> it's just more problems than it's worth, right? Chaos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and that's a simple setup. The lakes, I'm probably going to be running an eight weight. Mm-hmm. I've got a couple of eight weights and some floating lines ready. Ready to go. <laughs> ready to go. It's like, it's like I, I'm getting more excited now. Yeah. I love hearing the trout guy get way fired up for, like, temperate bass. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's like, it's going to be cool over here, but, like, man, the lakes. But, like, no, there's so other, many other and things that's what, that you can go for. That's what makes fishing fun, and even to even to hear him driving around with my windows down to scout for bugs. I mean, that's a different experience than knowing, man, the water temp, the sun comes through, it hits right, and yeah. the bugs hatch off the river oh, yeah. all the time. This yes. is what we're waiting on. But to go and look for them, to, to be the main food source and then find uh-huh. the fish. And do something else. You have the That's chance cool. to do someone else that no other bugger's doing. Yeah. Right? And that is like, you can be the man. It's not like, you could be it. You could be it. Mm. No, I might miss it. Mm-hmm. The, anyone listen to this program, you could go and get it and do something epic. Yeah. And one of the coolest things I think Socks told me is, and so as I said, Socks works with Southern Culture on the Fly magazine, and he came up with the idea that because this is so big and covers such a huge part of the country, to have... Use the use the magazine and and its its readership, but create a contest mm. that's not. There are places for the biggest fish, like you can go and catch the biggest trout, and send them a photo, hashtag it, and so on, and you can get entries. And if you catch a thirty inch trout or bigger, you might win that. Yeah, hopefully. I would Big think, carp, I would think striper, would. whatever. Yeah. But they also have other crazy shit going on too. Because this is this is this is not a normal magazine. This is a lot of fun. Um, you could uh, there's prizes. Hell, you write a song about cicadas. You know, cicada art drawings. So they're uh, just looking at fly. They want different things, and there's different there's different there's different categories you can enter in, and have the chance of winning some awesome prizes. The last time I talked to Sox, I think they had fifteen thousand dollars in prizes. Wow. Yeah, like this is like Dang. you can not only be cool yeah, cool in cool. your own little world, but you can be cool online and, and get some cool stuff. And yeah. this is just in celebration of the thirteen year hatch. Thirteen and the seventeen. And the seventeen. So it covers everywhere. Okay. That's right? Cool. So you across the country. Yeah. And and the other one, cicada recipes or eat as many cicadas as you can. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a that's part of the contest too. Oh yeah, you can be there. There are categories for Whoever that. Eats there's, the there's all these categories. Yeah, they they have got a warning on that. They're not responsible for any of the yeah. ill effects that goes. To, I don't there know. You go. I mean, I've like eaten a lot of weird stuff. I've eaten hex mayflies on the asabel at midnight and the holy water. I've eaten <laughs> sulfurs out here. Sulfurs taste like bananas, right? Trust me. Really? Yeah. And and caddis, the green caddis, yeah. tastes like wintergreen. Mints. Mints. Y'all, y'all yeah. remember, this is coming Absolutely. from the man who has told us before off mic that he's hunted and eaten kangaroo. Yeah. So I don't know. Oh, and kangaroo are delicious. <laughs> yeah. So if you're on the river and you've got bad coffee breath, pop in a caddis. Uh, yeah. Is that what that's you're right. saying? Absolutely. Trust me. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I almost stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. And if you say it with confidence, they believe you, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Dead set. <laughs> as far as just general presentation, what would be kind of some guidelines that you would say? So, uh, you know... The, I'd tell everyone to go back and watch the previous episode. and Maybe you can put a link to it. That we did with the, yeah, on the on hoppers, hoppers and Because it's the same. When it comes to actually putting the fly to a fish on this river mm-hmm. or any river, smallmouth, creek, and so on, being able to present your cast, cover a lot of water, uh, and, and lining up your body position, all the principles we worked over in that episode, mm-hmm. and letting them eat 
turn their heads down. And wait. And wait. God yeah. save the queen, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> God save the king these days. Oh, that's right. Um, <laughs> We've had, there's, yeah, there's been some, cha- some changes. changes in leadership yeah. since that um, last podcast. But uh, those principles, that episode covered that mm-hmm. really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I if you do say doing so that yourself, one. yeah, no, no, no. But it, <laughs> well, you guys, you guys, we worked through it. No, we went caught fish too. too, and we and it worked. And for having not done it, and that's a the way you laid it out there too was good because it was like very principled, like steps, like one through five or six yes. or seven, however many steps we had. But we went out and did it, and then it was like, oh, this makes so much sense, and the ability to pick up, cast again, position yeah. your body right, so you're not wearing yourself out. And you're, you're not, not missing bunches of bank. Right. Because when you you what we were talking about is, is is picking up regularly, facing the same position, and you actually can move your fly down the bank in steps of maybe ten feet. Mm-hmm. And so you only miss maybe four feet when your fly's in the air. Whereas a lot of people wait too long and then miss thirty or forty feet right. by spinning it back downstream. Mm-hmm. Um so you know, covering the water and again. Fish where you can hear the bugs. Yeah. Where they're loud. Right. Yeah. It'd be a good time. I, I'm looking be. forward to it. Um, you know, obviously, like you were you were even saying earlier, it's not even just the fish. Like, I'm sure, you know, turkey season's coming up, and depending on when the hatches align, like, you might you might kind of think about if you're hearing some cicadas. I know, you know, turkey's going to be eating those, too. And so. Yeah. Um, you want my guess? It's like sometime after February, May 10th. Yeah. Okay, as we'll so start like right to at the end of turkey season. But you, it, for people wandering out there, they build little mud tunnels mm-hmm. on the surface when they start to come out. So okay. if you want to wander around, wear your snake boots and wander around and go and find it, you can you can dial it in that way in your area yeah. too. And visually scout. Like yeah, that. or if your dog starts scratching in the yard, might not be moles. They can actually hear them crawling around. Oh, yeah. Probably oh. vibrating down there. Uh-huh. Nice. Yeah, I bet. I mean, I bet. Turkeys are impacted. They eat better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bears get after them. Yep. I would. Big I protein. Bear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's hell. Cool. I, I'm, I'm thinking of working up like the little Thai chili and Man. garlic we and do stuff. a cicada do... cook-off. Yeah. Awesome. There. I'll there. cook them. You eat them. <laughs> <laughs> Good trade. Steve, send, Good us a, <laughs> send us a picture of your 35-inch brown on the cicada this year. Yeah, well, we're going to call it. Dude, if I get a striper, it's just going to be so epic. <laughs> Send, send us a picture of that. Send too. us pics. Also, I know you've got some pictures. We'll probably be posting these on Instagram of some of the from the last time, and then even in this it, this book, we'll get some. Oh yeah, we see. didn't mention this book. If you want to re- do some research, Gene Kritsky is a uh, entomology professor in Ohio, and he's written this book, uh, "Tale of Two Broods," which covers this year. And it, he's not a fisherman, mm-hmm. but he's a scientist that knows. Stuff. I spent a lot of time talking to him about this as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, this book's awesome. It's got great photos on the way the bugs are going to look. Yeah, and this is this is exactly what we were talking about with yeah. the colors of the yeah. belly. Helpful if you're a fly tire. Yeah. Go check this book out. You can pick it up on Amazon for 20 bucks. It has a lot of history, a lot of scientific information. If you want to fish this and, and get better and, you know, the other thing, if we all get excited about this, we might start bombarding those and go and visit them in Tennessee. Mm, yeah. Appalachians, because there's more coming. There won't You won't see it here for 13 years, but they're happening in other places, and, you know, I like seeing you walk. <laughs>